Welcome to lecture 6 of the wireless communication course at Chalmers University of Technology. My name is Henk Wemiersch. In this lecture, we'll cover part of chapter 7 of the wireless communication book by Andrea Goldschmidt. We'll focus on diversity and error analysis of diversity methods. At the end of this lecture, you should be able to describe different diversity methods, different combining methods, draw block diagrams, and evaluate outage and average error probabilities. First, a brief recap of previous lecture. Last time, we saw that there are different notions of SNR, shown here on the top right. SNR after path loss, after SNR after path loss and shadowing, and SNR after path loss, shadowing, and multipath. We saw that the SNR after shadowing has a certain Gaussian distribution with a mean given by the SNR after path loss only. From this, we can draw a realization of the SNR after path loss and shadowing, and then find the distribution of the SNR after path loss shadowing and multipath, given by an exponential distribution with a mean given by the SNR after path loss and shadowing. We also saw the following model for the flat fading channel. Here U of t is a transmitted signal, C of t is a time varying channel, a scalar channel, and N of t is noise. The picture on the right shows how the channel can change over time. For such a channel, there are two relevant performance metrics, outage probability, the probability that the SNR falls below a certain threshold, or the average error probability, which is just the instantaneous error probability for a given SNR, average over all possible SNRs. It can then be shown that for the same average SNR, the performance of the additive white Gaussian noise channel is very different from the performance over Rayleigh fading. So the two curves here, the curve in red for the additive white Gaussian noise channel and the curve in blue for the Rayleigh fading channel should be considered under the same average SNR. We see that there's a huge gap of multiple decibels, which is what we'll try to recover today. So we try to go back to get the performance approximating the additive white Gaussian noise channel. One thing we didn't talk about last time, which is possibly important, is that there exists a convenient technique for computing average error probabilities. Because in general, you need to solve an integral and this may not be very tractable. This technique is based on the moment generating function, which is essentially the Laplace transform of the distribution. So more specifically, given a certain random variable x with a certain density, p of x, we can compute the moment generating function of x, mx with argument s, as computing this integral. Okay, so it's just the density and e to the power sx and you integrate over x. It turns out that this function has something called the moment generating property. So by taking derivatives of this function and evalu evaluating an s equal to zero, we find the moments of the original random variable. So now we can apply the moment generating function to the fading distribution. So let's say here p gamma of x is the fading distribution, let's say exponential for really fading, e to the power s x is what we need to compute a moment generating function. So this here would be the moment generating function of the fading distribution. It turns out, because in exponential multiplied by an exponential and integrated has a nice close form expression, that we can compute the moment generating function for really fading and Ryerson fading in closed form. For the Rayleigh fading case, this moment generating function has only one parameter, the average SNR. S is a variable here. For the Ryson distribution, we have two parameters, the average SNR and the K factor, which tells us the balance in power between the line of sight and the non-line of sight paths. Let us now use this moment generating function for computing average error probability. So the first line is just the definition of the moment generating function. The second line is the definition of the average error probability. We know that the instantaneous error probability for certain SNR has a standard expression for many constellations. So a scalar, a Q function with inside another scalar and the SNR. We can now substitute this Q function inside of this expression and then we get this line here. So the average SNR can be written as this complicated expression here. In this, we have used the so-called Craig's formula, which is a way to express the Q function as an integral over an exponential. What we recognize now is the density of the SNR and an exponential and an integral from zero to plus infinity. And this is exactly the definition of a moment generating function. So we pull out alpha over pi, 
we pull out the integral from 0 to pi over 2, and what remains must be a moment generating function evaluated in the appropriate argument. This appropriate argument tends to turns out to be minus g over sine squared of phi, and we integrate over phi. Now it seems like we may have not gained much, we've just come from one integral of the average error probability to another integral of the average error probability. However, the second integral can typically evaluate it easily numerically, mainly because now the uh, integration boundaries are finite. It just goes from 0 to pi over 2 rather than from 0 to plus infinity. So this is an integral that is easy to compute. Finally, last time we also saw the performance of differential phase shift keying in fast fading conditions. The final result was the following. In this figure we show on the x-axis the average SNR due to path loss and shadowing and on the y-axis the bit error rate. Different curves correspond to different Doppler shifts. So Fm here is the maximum Doppler shift, which is the velocity of the user over the wavelength. We see that when the Doppler shift is zero, we have the dark blue curve corresponding to Fm equal to zero. This curve is almost the same as the curve we had for the Rayleigh fading case. In fact, and this is a correction over the last lecture, there's a 3 dB penalty in average error probability over Rayleigh with a known channel. So Rayleigh would be 3 dB to the left. Really with coherent detection, of course. The other curves for non-zero Doppler shift, they all have what is called an error floor. This means that no matter how high the SNR gets, the performance has a certain limit. The, symbol, the bit error cannot go below this limit. And finally, when the Doppler sh maximum Doppler increases, this error floor goes up. So for very high velocity, the performance will be limited by the Doppler shift. In principle, when this Doppler shift tends to infinity, then the bit error rate will be limited to about 0.5. So half of the bits will be wrong. We are now ready to start the topic of this lecture, diversity. In diversity, we will send the same input signal, u of t, over multiple signal paths towards the receiver. Each signal path will have the same path loss and shadowing, but can have different fast fading and will of course have independent noise. This then leads to multiple outputs which should be treated properly by the receiver. The figure on the right shows, for instance for three channels, the evolution of the SNR as a function of time. We see that each of the channels can have large fluctuations in terms of their SNR, but for instance the maximum of the three has much less fluctuation and thus provides better performance. There are different ways that we can create multiple signal paths. Ideally, we would like to have independent signals over each of these paths. So we would like the fast fading to be independent from each path. This is because if the fast fading is highly correlated, then one of the paths is bad, all of them will be bad. Different ways to have independent signals is over space, so using multiple receive antennas, in time, by repeating the signal multiple times, or by frequency by repeating the same signal over multiple frequency bands. In order to have independent signals, we should be careful in how we space these transmissions. We recall from the lecture of Rayleigh fading and the Jake's model that the channel autocorrelation function becomes zero at about half a wavelength. This means that if we put multiple receive antennas about half a wavelength apart, each antenna will see an independent channel. Similarly in time, if we distance our transmissions with about one coherence time, we will have independent channels for each transmission. And finally, over frequency, by repeating the same signal simultaneously over different frequency bands that are separated at least one coherence bandwidth, we will have independent channels in frequency. There are other ways to get diversity, for instance polarization and angle, as well as coding. The question then becomes, how do we combine the different outputs and what will be the performance? Let us now formalize the diversity combining problem. We consider discrete time communication with m independent fading channel with equal statistics. So for instance, each channel would be really fading with the same average SNR. Over each of these channels, we send the same input symbol s. s could be a symbol from a QAM constellation, and we receive m outputs. The output ai, at the output of branch i, will be given by the transmitted symbol s, which is the same for all of the branches, times a complex channel gain, which comprises an amplitude and a phase, and noise, where the noise is just standard complex Gaussian, IID, so independent for each of the branches. 
we further assume that the complex channel gain for each of the branches is known. We can then try to answer the following questions. What is the instantaneous SNR per channel? The average SNR per channel? How would you process the observation to form a maximum likelihood estimate of S? I recall that a maximum likelihood estimate has certain properties in terms of performance. What is the instantaneous SNR after processing and what is the average SNR after processing? You now may wish to pause the video to try to answer these questions and then resume the video once you are done. The instantaneous SNR for channel I is found by looking at the instantaneous amplitude AI. The SNR is then given by AI squared times the signal energy over the noise power spectral density. The average SNR, on the other hand, it requires further taking an expectation over AI. Since each of the channels has the same statistics, the average SNR is the same for all of the channels and is obtained by taking the signal energy times the expected value of the amplitude squared over the noise power spectral density. Then the maximum likelihood detector is found as follows. The maximum likelihood estimate of S by definition is given by the arg max over all possible S of the likelihood function P of Y given S. Here we also include the notation beta, where beta comprises all of the complex channel gains over all of the channels. This is a vector of length m. We can then take the logarithm of the right hand side, which does not affect the maximization, so then we can obtain log of p of y given s and beta. Since y is only now affected by Gaussian noise, the logarithm of the Gaussian distribution is an exponential, with a minus sign, we remove the minus sign and obtain a minimization over s of the following norm of y minus beta times s. So what we're trying to do is we try to find the s that gives the minimum Euclidean distance between y and beta times s. We then expand the square. This gives us a term in y squared, a term, bet a term beta squared times s squared, and a cross term. Now from the point of view of the minimization, the first term does not matter because it does not depend on s. The second and third term do depend on s. However, the second term does not depend on y. So what we see is that beta Hermitian times y is sufficient to make a decision on s. In other words, if I give you the complete observation y, then you can solve the maximum likelihood problem. At the same time, if I were to only give you B Hermitian times Y, which is just one complex number, you could also solve the maximum likelihood problem. So beta Hermitian times Y is a sufficient statistic. In other words, knowing this is sufficient to solve the maximum likelihood problem. So now what we can do is we can look at the statistics of beta Hermitian times Y. So first of all, let's look at the instantaneous SNR of beta Hermitian times Y. We know that y itself is beta times s plus n, by definition. We can then look at the signal term and the noise term. The signal term has beta Hermitian beta s, while the noise term has beta Hermitian times n. The SNR of beta Hermitian times y is then given as follows. It's denoted by gamma sigma, so gamma is SNR, sigma refers to sum is the ratio of the signal power, beta Hermitian times beta times s, over the noise power, beta Hermitian times n. So we take the square and an expectation. We then find in the numerator a beta to the power of 4 times s squared, and in the denominator beta squared times n naught. We know that there's an additional step needed from here to here, which is left for the viewer. We can then cross out beta squared here, have one beta squared left over, we can expand beta squared as the sum of the ai squared. And what we then see is that we end up with the sum of the individual channel SNRs, which was defined in the beginning. So beta Hermitian times y has an SNR that is the sum of the SNRs of the individual branches. So when we have different diversity branches and we apply maximum likelihood, we obtain something called maximal ratio combining in which we weigh each of the branches with the complex conjugate of the channel. This means that better branches get larger weight. What this also means is that we co-phase the channel, so we align the phases of all the channels, 
and then each channel is multiplied with its amplitude. It then follows that the output SNR is the sum of the individual input SNRs. Now this is the instantaneous SNR. In order to look at the distribution of the SNR, we need to look at the distributions of the instantaneous SNR and we will need to make assumptions regarding independence. So in particular, under Rayleigh fading, when each of the channels are IID, then we have the sum of IID exponential random variables. So recall, under Rayleigh fading, the SNR is exponentially distributed. The sum of MIID exponential random variables is a chi-squared random variable, or a gamma distribution. So for this specific case, it is possible to compute, in closed form, the density of the output SNR. Here, given on the left-hand side, is the density. On the right-hand side, the cumulative distribution function. We see how the density evol evolves with different values of m, and also depends on the average SNR, which is assumed to be the same for each of the branches. We can then look at the statistics of this distribution. We find that the mean of this distribution is just m times the average SNR per branch. This is to be expected from the relationship above. If we take expectation, we find this linear relationship. However, we can also compute the variance of the output SNR, and this turns out to be m times the variance of the input SNRs. The scaling of the average output SNR with m is called array gain. This is because when we have more diversity branches, we are collecting more power. When we add more and more branches, the array gain will increase and increase. For the purpose of fairness, what we could do is we could divide the SNR per branch by m so that the total SNR is somehow conserved. This means that the output SNR will have a mean of the average SNR, gamma bar, and a variance equal to the average SNR squared over m. Hence, when n is increasing, the average SNR is constant, but the variance will be reducing. This means that when m is increased, while the SNR per branch is divided by m, the channel will look more and more like an additive white Gaussian noise channel. Recall that an additive white Gaussian noise channel has a constant SNR. In any case, we can compute altitude and average error probabilities, and we will so show that diversity shows up in the slope of the altitude probability and in the average error probability. Let us now look at the density of the output SNR. We consider the case of maximum ratio combining with an average per branch SNR of 1. The figure on the left shows the density of the output SNR as a function of the SNR. When we only have one branch, m equal to 1, we find the traditional exponential distribution, where the average value is 1. When we have two branches, m equal to 2, we find a different distribution with an average value equal to 2. Three branches, another distribution with an average value equal to 3. With 10 branches, we find yet another very flat distribution with an average value equal to 10. So again, we see that when the number of branches increases, the average increases linearly and the variance increases quadratically in m. The increase of the average SNR is called array gain. On the right, we now consider the case where the average SNR is not 1, but 1 over m. Again, we show the density of the SNR at the output after maximum ratio combining. When m is equal to 1, we obtain the dark blue curve, which is the same as on the left-hand side with a mean equal to 1. When m is equal to 2, we obtain the green curve, which has a similar shape as on the left side, but with a mean equal to 1. This is because we divide the average SNR by m. The density is also more concentrated. When m is equal to 10, we obtain the light blue curve here, which again has an average value of 1, but is very concentrated around this value. So when m increases unbounded, the density will tend to a direct delta distribution 
at 1. We now see that when we divide the average SNR by M, we no longer have array gain. So we no longer see the shift of the average of the SNR with M. However, now the channel behaves more and more like an additive white Gaussian noise channel, which is what our, was our goal in the first place. Now, given the density of the SNR, we can compute outage probabilities and average error probabilities. Let's first look at outage probability. So on the left-hand side, we show the outage probability assuming a fixed average SNR per branch equal to one. We pick a certain uh, threshold gamma zero below which we declare an outage. So the outage probability is the probability that the output SNR falls below this threshold. On the x-axis, we show the average SNR per branch divided by the threshold in a db domain. So when the average SNR is equal to the threshold value, we are at a value of zero. We consider different values of m. First of all, m equal to one, a single branch. We see for a single branch, which is basically really fading, the probability that the output SNR is below the threshold value is quite high. Here, maybe around 50 or more percent. With increasing values of m, the curves shift leftward. So for instance, for m equal to 5, light blue, we find an outage probability for an average SNR equal to gamma 0 of 1%. Of course, when the average SNR is greater than gamma 0, we of course have even lower outage probabilities. Again, we see a shifting of the curves due to array gain and a increase in of the slope of the curves due to diversity gain. Let us now look at the average error probability for maximum ratio combining. Recall the definition of average error probability, which involves the error probability for a given SNR averaged with respect to the density of the SNRs, which should now be considered the density of the output SNR after maximum ratio combining. It will be convenient to consider a general expression for the instantaneous error probability, which depends on the output SNR, which is itself the sum of all the input SNRs. Because the different channels are independent in our case, it turns out that the moment generating function of the sum, so the sum of the SNRs is equal to gamma, is the product of the individual moment generating functions of the individual SNRs. And this, after some math, math, allows us to write the average error probability as a product of the moment generating functions of the individual channels. Since each of the channels of each of the branches has the same SNR distribution, we can replace this product with a power. In general, this integral cannot be solved in closed form. There are some exceptions, such as BPSK with Rayleigh fading. However, in most cases, we can have an approximate expression in which the average error probability can be written in this form. So it's basically a power of m. This in turn allows us to visualize the average error probability, for instance, for BPSK. So the figure here on the left shows average error probability as a function of the average SNR per branch. We see for m equal to 1, the traditional curve for Rayleigh fading, and then for different values of m, a shift of those curves plus an increase in slope. So we see array gain, the shifting, and diversity gain, the slope. When we consider the case where we divide the average SNR by m, we shift all of these curves rightward by a factor of 10 log 10. Then the curve for m equal to 1 is the same, standard Rayleigh really fading, but for increasing values of m, we find that the curve simply becomes more steep. And in the limit for m equal to infinity, we find the average error probability for BPSK. So we obtain something very close to the additive white Gaussian noise channel, which again was our original goal. There exist other combining methods than maximum ratio combining. One of them is equal gain combining, where we only do co-phasing, so we align all the phases of the different branches, but we don't account for amplitudes. Others are, for instance, selection combining, where we take the best branch at each time. Selection combining is nice because it allows for a closed form expression of the output density. It turns out that selection combining leads to an output SNR, which is strictly less than the 
output SNR for maximum ratio combining. Also, the scaling with respect to M is different. This means we have fundamentally less array gain with selection combining. There is also threshold combining, which is similar to selection combining, but requires less switching between branches. We would also like to point out the difference between transmitter and receive diversity. This is especially pronounced in the multi-antenna regime. So far, we have mainly focused on multi-antenna receive diversity, where the transmitter uses one antenna to send a signal, and this is received via M receive antennas spaced lambda over 2 apart to generate independent channels between transmitter and receiver. We can also create transmit diversity, in which the receiver only has one antenna, but the transmitter has many. For instance, when the channel is known at the transmitter, it is possible to pre-code the transmission to have full diversity gain and array gain. We will talk more about this in the MIMO lecture. When the channel is not known at the transmitter, we can develop special coding schemes such as the Alamuti scheme to create diversity. These were the learning outcomes for today. You should be able to describe realizations of diversity, distinguish between different combining methods, draw block diagrams of combining schemes, com compute output SNRs, and evaluate outage and average error probabilities. You should also be able to explain the difference between array gain and diversity gain.